We good? Okay. Hey guys, um, thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'm very excited to introduce you to the lovely Sanaya, better known as San Junes. Um, she's a classically trained pianist um, and she's also a music production graduate um, at Point Bl from Point Blank. Um, we've done quite a few masterclasses with her before, but mostly based around um, production. And she, I think this is a new kind of live performance setup. Um, she's going to be opening for Bonobo in Mumbai in a few weeks, so um, which is amazing. And she's gonna be chatting through her kind of live performance setup for you guys today. So yeah, round of applause for Sanaya. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Hi, um, thank you for coming. And uh, welcome to my, my rig, I guess. Um, just by show of hands, does, uh, does everyone here Already produce, already produce music, and does okay great yeah okay amazing, and does everyone here already perform it slash DJ, okay cool, so I guess the the common intention in the room is to, like maybe spark some ideas on how to figure out electronic music performance, which in and of itself is uh, a difficult thing in a in a way because. When you come from an organic world of playing instruments, it's very easy to navigate how to perform that either as a standalone thing or in a band. And then you're in a world where, in a modular sense, everything has infinite possibilities. So hopefully today I can take you through two different styles of approaching electronic music performance that have either worked for me or that I'm currently using right now. Um, Feel free to stop me and ask me questions at any point of time. Um, and uh, yeah, let's get into it. So one of the, the main sort of elements in my setup that kind of acts as the basis or the backbone of what I'm, uh, of, of, of the backbone of the whole set is Ableton Live. I can use a whole bunch of different tools and toys that either make their own sounds or uh, that are playing, acting as MIDI instruments and playing sounds from Ableton, but I use Ableton Live as my master clock. I use it as the kind of basis to build on. Um, has anyone already started building a live set? Or has anyone in the room ever, ever built a live set before? Amazing, okay. It's really been like with a mic and like pedals. Okay. And a guitar. It's never been using Ableton. Okay, okay. Cool. So I guess the um, one of the really cool things about uh, about using Ableton to perform, Ableton Live to perform, is that, um, oh, sh should we get, yeah, thanks, is that um, you can kind of upgrade the idea of what it would be like to use a loop station and a, and a guitar and vocals or what it would be like to use a sampler. And you can do all of those things and more if you have this world as your, as your backbone or your setup. So um, maybe we can just swap over to my, my screen and I can show you what I'm looking at at the moment. Um, could we do, yeah. Um, does this look remotely familiar to anyone? Yep, cool. So. This is the sessions view. As you can see, I've got a bunch of different uh, clips in here. Most of them are clips of audio. And um, I think when you're coming at a live set, one of the most key things to ask yourself is, while you perform, what do you want to be doing? Do you want to be like the, the person who's sampling different sounds and um, you know, launching different clips, so then therefore you're gonna be pressing buttons. Do you wanna be uh, creating an arrangement on the fly and therefore you'll be making all the transitions happen? Or do you wanna be maybe more acting like someone who is in a band in the sense that you get to play the instrument and not think about certain stuff so it frees you up to really perform? So once, and, and that, that differs for everyone and, and for different rooms that you'll be playing in or for different music that you're making, if you can first answer or uh, ask that question, then Ab Ableton Live, but also it could even, you know, it could even be Logic or it could even be no computer and 
a bunch of different hardware, those, uh, your setup and the gear would then answer those questions. But that, that question, I would say, is like the most important thing to ask yourself. So in the beginning, when I started making music, I would have these tracks that I would make in my studio and I found it very challenging to, to figure out what I would be doing in the live arena and how does it become live if I've made the track in my studio and I can't, I can't sort of just play it like a DJ would because then I might as well be DJing and have less things to think about. So I realized that I wanted to really play with the arrangement and I wanted to have improvisation as a big element of what I was doing so that if the moment called for it, I would, I would be able to change the tempo or like, you know, just completely jump from one style to another, maybe break things down, isolate them, uh, maybe play some keyboards. So I, I made it all possible for myself initially in the sessions view. And what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm just going to do a little demo in the sessions view and then sort of talk about how I've structured it out. Maybe you, you guys will be able to... I'll, I'll keep this open for now so that... Um, yeah. So I'm going to do a demo and then talk about a few tricks in the sessions view that really helped me with... One of the main things that I struggled with was like monotony because you're... Sometimes with loop music, it's very nice when you're playing it, but you can get into a, into a long spell of audio where not enough elements change. So, okay, I'll stop talking. I'm just gonna, oh, I'm just going to go for it. like a little demo of like all the different things that I can do in the sessions view currently without my brain exploding because I've chosen three specific areas and I'm like okay I'm gonna build on the arrangement I'm gonna improvise on an instrument and I'm gonna trigger clips um so any any questions all, all so far yeah go for it uh, where would it like single fit in uh, anywhere, everywhere actually. Like you could have a mic that goes through your setup, through your interface, which you can toggle to have come on and off. You can use effects while you're singing. You can loop yourself. You can, uh, you can basically utilize your setup to perform the, the backing track or the backing band and have a, a performative um, live set that is kind of focused on vocals 
I think actually there's there's a whole lot you can do, and there's a ton of different artists who use um, a lot of MIDI controllers and Ableton to kind of replace the loop station world and that setup. Um, yeah, any did that answer your question? Yeah. So okay, so what I did was I went back into my project file, um, which is a separate file from the live set. And I decided to uh, stem things out separately. But instead of st stemming out my whole track, I just picked pockets. I know I said that everything is audio, but there is a bunch of MIDI stuff in here. Um, so I picked loops that were about 4, 8, 16 bars. The longer, the better, because then there's less chance of people catching on that it's only a four bar loop. And I made these different tracks, and I separated it. Um, I separated it kind of like different parts, almost like I'm thinking. Then I've got the live synth, which is the Nord, which I was just playing. Uh, I might just solo this for you guys for a second so you understand. Right, so. And then what I did is I I've assumed that it would be a better thing to do to use filters to fade stuff in and out. I prefer to do that rather than working with volume because that frees me up to go into a room and set my levels and kind of try to tune my, do my sound check on the basis of the room. So I wouldn't really automate or map any of my track volumes. What I did do was use very basic uh, audio effects like filters and the other effects that I'm using are um, delays and reverbs, which I'm using as sends and not as inserts. So. Uh, you can see those over here. So, um, then the, the really key thing is to choose a MIDI controller that works for you. And it might be one which has buttons as well as knobs and faders. Um, the buttons are really useful for launching clips and then you kind of need the knobs and faders to, to, to use it in, in the orientation of like, okay, this would be a mixer. And I just map the frequency of the uh, of the channel that I'm manipulating to a, a knob or fader of my choosing. And here you can see I've got I've got the access to make this like a radio thing um, in bringing stuff in and out. And if it's live, it's key part. Improvisation. There's ample room for stuff to happen that you weren't expecting because your bandwidth, the potential for under underutilized. In fact, I don't use it enough because I forget some sometimes that the same groove has been playing for like the last minute and a half, and I haven't been able to change it enough and it gets, it can get kind of stale. So this is a great way for, you'll see it happen now. Maybe I should just set it to one for now. And I'm also gonna, okay, so there are two follow actions. There's this little box on the left and the box on the right. You can even set it up like a probability, like, Kind of like a surprise me option. Um, so let's say next, and let, then, then let's send, set the right one to previous. And this is your probability box. I'm going to set this to 500 and 500. OK. We've got a clip above and a clip below. Now you can see the box below there. All I did was. Is that clear what happened right now? So after a bar, now I'll change it to two bars so that it, we see it a little bit better. 50% of the time it's gonna go to the next clip. And now it's just gonna loop on this clip because this clip has no follow-up actions saved. And the other 50% of the time it's gonna go to the previous clip. Super useful. Um, super useful because if I wanna move through the track, if I do something that I thought would be good to look at is clip automation. Um, just make it drastic. 
you can even set this up to do stuff that will help cue you like like you'll remember that at the end of the clip when the volume comes comes up again it's time to move to the next section or something like that um so yeah it's really cold so i'm going to put on my jacket you see so those are the two the two like tools that are kind of useful um which i only discovered uh after years of of using the sessions view as a sampler and i was just pressing buttons um and a, a, a lot of the time it it's not an action that has a lot of visibility so it's difficult to be performative with it even if you're really into it sometimes you may be you may be doing like uh maybe you're playing the groove live using um one shot samples but it might not it might not necessarily translate to someone who's on the other side of the console especially if you're in a dj console and in a setup where people can't really look at your toys and what you're doing so um to answer that kind of predicament which i felt was like a big gap between the audience and where i was i decided i wanted to be pressing buttons less and i wanted to be playing more because my background is that i was bred in bands and i was always playing keys and um that brings me to the second section of uh what i'm talking about which is um exploring the arrange view instead of the sessions view um to perform so i'm just going to open another project file so far so good any questions what kind of music is everyone into i uh, like um i make trip hop oh cool vocals amazing does everyone has hate music <laughs> it just sucks <laughs> It's the worst. <laughs> uh, are you into zero seven? Have you heard of zero seven? Great, great trip hop band with uh, amazing vocals. They've done some stuff with Jose Gonzalez and also with um, Sia. Wow. They're old but so good. Kind of like Air, if you've heard of Air. I love Air. Yeah, <laughs> me too. In fact, when I got into production, that's that's all I wanted to make was. Yeah, same here. <laughs> nice. So basically this probably looks a way load more complicated but um don't worry about that. Um if you are someone who plays instruments and you'd prefer not to even think about the arrangement and pressing buttons and maybe you just want to sing your songs the way you would sing them in a studio and you want a setup that acts kind of like a representation of your production but you don't necessarily want to be doing minute things live you don't want to be increasing the you know the the frequency on some cut off on some synth that is not necessarily integral to your performance and that's kind of where i'm at right now i find that this view is awesome to play in and there's a lot of uh there's a lot of bands that actually use Ableton Live while they're performing so they have like a four piece they're they're full on four piece setup and you wouldn't you wouldn't tell that they're playing with tracks but there's so much production value that can't necessarily be emulated live by even 100 guitar pedals and like five SPDs around a drummer that it just makes sense to have it in a in a track and have the audio playing and have one person control it and you do have control over it but you're not necessarily focusing on telling or uh, telling live what comes next it just is all printed so again i'll just do a demo and then i'll talk about a couple of things that were super helpful in this view and this really helps me go from instrument to instrument and i've set it up in a way that is is kind of freeing in its nature in that i don't even have to change my patches it just is all pre it predisposed to know what i wanted to do so at one point in the set when i hit the pad it's going to play a bell but at another point in the set it's just going to play a different kit but i don't have to manually navigate that so that was a really helpful part of my um my flow but for this uh one of the things that i'm doing 
is I'm playing to a click. Does everybody know what that means? Um, and you don't necessarily need to do that if you're in the sessions view, I feel, unless you've got uh, dummy clips that are, that are changing your, uh, your tempo around. But I find that in the arrange view, uh, it is kind of helpful to play with the click. And I'll take you through later how it's so easy to, to make your tempo changes across your whole set happen on their own. So if you just give me a second. Oops. Awesome. OK. Cool. OK, so here's a demo on my range view. Change some stuff around earlier today, so I'm just going to make sure that everything is on the right channel. Uh, da da da. Yes. And so. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> you know, you can, you can never be too prepared, but then something is always going to jump out at you. <laughs> and it's always good to have a really solid tech rehearsal. OK, cool. So now we are good to go. So I'm just going to start that again.
the arrange view. And one super helpful uh, aspect of it that I forgot to mention is that you don't need to look at your screen. And that can really help even as a musician that kind of just gets you into a better place in order to perform and to project um, whatever intent that you're really trying to project with your music. So, um, I don't know, I don't know if, it, if it translated, but I'm currently in a place where I find this view a lot more uh, easy to connect with because I get to play my instruments again, which otherwise when you're using this view, um, which is the sessions view, you kind of keep have to looking at the screen to know what you're going to be triggering. Even if you've memorized the shapes, sometimes you're going to be, you're going to wind up going back to your screen. And uh, um, I'm kind of going for something new where I want to even like have my laptop like that on the floor and not even not even look at it and just like play like a like a band. Um, so a couple of uh, things that are really useful about this view. Well, there's like a million things that are really useful about both of them. But what I any any questions so far with with what just happened? Did everyone uh, like were you guys able to figure out what what I was doing when I was on here and cool? So it is pretty straightforward. There's nothing really that's happening that's. Um, that's that ingenious, uh, unfortunately. But um, one thing that I find really cool is that I can go from song to song at the song's original tempo, and I don't have to be the one manipulating that and controlling that. I literally have just automated my tempo to go through the whole set. And if, um, if I... Here we go, there. Uh, if I zoom out, like super zoom out, basically what you'll see is that this is kind of like all the songs that I have pieced together side by side, all the, all the songs that I have in my set. Um, and it, it's easy to, uh, to move stuff around and, um, and kind of predetermine your, uh, your set list basically. Um, and that can change from gig to gig, uh, but you've got your tempo synced, you've got your patch changes on point, you've got all the automation that you want pre-written in, written in, and then there's certain controls that I am automating live, particularly with my instruments, so that that's not uh, being you know controlled by Ableton Live. That's all happening on the fly. And um, right, so one thing is that it's easy to to just have the the graph of your set visually in front of you, uh, and that that's the tempo the tempo that I'm looking at at the moment in my master channel. And the other thing is when you have uh, an external instrument sending MIDI information to a to a synth, for example, you could also be having it sending MIDI information to an Axe FX if anybody uses guitars, or you could uh, have it going anywhere. MIDI communicates with everything. Um, it's been really useful to have my patch changes coming from here because otherwise in order to get from my saved preset 75 to like 50 in the next song and then 51 in the third song, it would just take me too long to do it from the synth itself. Uh, and it's also something I don't want to think about because it, it's not appealing in a performance arena in my mind. So you have the ability again from the note section in your clip view to set send your patches and right now I'm on, say I'm on 92, it's just a little dummy clip that has that information in it. There's no MIDI notes in that, in, in this clip. It's totally blank here. But if I play this, boom, my patches changed to 79. Um, in, I mean, it's, it's a pretty basic thing, but it, it actually saves a lot of brain space because I know that even within a song, I can go from that to, uh, I can go from that to that without having to to do it manually and I can just be totally focused on the playing. So that's the arrange view. It, does anybody have any questions? No? Um, cool. Well, those were the, the main things that I was going to cover. Uh, um, I'm just looking to see if I've missed anything that's significant. 
uh, it really kind of how how you determine uh, your setup, whether it's from the hardware point of view of what gear you're going to use or how you're going to navigate the the software and construct a live set. It really depends on the style of music that you want to uh, want to play, but. At the end of the day, it comes back to that main question of like, what do you want to be doing while you're performing? And if you're singing or if you're playing an instrument, honestly, that's a big chunk of the question answered because when somebody is watching you, whether it's at a club or a music venue or at a festival or in like a small living room performance, they will be able to relate to what you're doing very easily because it's, uh, it's probably like hardwired into our brains to look at an instrument being played, whether it's a piano or a guitar, or whatever, or see a singer and know that, okay, they're performing. But when you're playing buttons and controllers, very often people who aren't familiarized with the equipment or the world of electronic music will be hard pressed to gauge what you're doing live. It, it almost, I mean, many times I've been at a gig or I've been playing a gig where they've just been like, what is, what is she even doing or what are they even doing? Um, and is it like, then the question of like, are they even playing arises and is it like, are they just, is, did someone just push play and whatever. Um, so I think uh, in that light, being performative around electronic music is kind of important in a way that, that at least you're able to demonstrate that you are doing something live and you're not, you haven't just pushed play. But it is a difficult world to, to navigate uh, if, you had to, uh, if you had to choose one thing to do live because there's so many options. Even what I just went through in the sessions view or here was pretty minuscule. I mean, you can use sequencers, you can, um, you can be literally using a, a MIDI controller that only has one shots. And I don't know if, you, if you've heard of uh, Jeremy Ellis. Like, I mean, that's live performance with one shots that, I mean, you, it, it's clear what he's doing. It takes a lot of skill, but he's obviously uh, set it up in a way where it's one thing and it's everything. He's doing only one thing, but it's covering the entire gamut of the music that he's, that he's performing. Um, he's a, he's a, he plays, he plays pa pads basically, but he's extremely proficient and he plays them like an instrument in a way that you can't not tell that he's, that's what he's doing. So I guess if that's the, the fundamental um, chunk of what you want to be doing live, then it ticks a lot of boxes. And if not, it takes a, a few gigs and a little bit of working around to figure out what really works, both for you and for the music, actually. Um, so yeah, I hope this was helpful. And it was just like a little insight into two, two methods that I've used and that I still use that, that serve my purpose. Um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Guys, do you have any questions? If so, yeah. let me give you the mic. Um, I was just wondering if you could go through the stuff that you're using here or that you normally use. Oh, sure. Like my setup? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so MacBook Pro um, with the right specs. I mean, that's a, that's a gray area, but with enough enough power to manage a bunch of things, preferably uh, preferably eight sticks of RAM, uh, I mean eight gigs of RAM, and uh, preferably an OS that is slightly non-ancient so that you won't have driver incompatibilities. Um, the interface I'm using today is the Native Instruments Complete Audio 6. It's very robust and very solid and hasn't given me too much trouble. Uh, choosing the right interface depends really on how many inputs and outputs you're gonna require um, in your live set. And I'm actually in the process of moving to another one which has more outputs so that I can give my sound engineer more control and I can send all of my audio to him separately in order for him to mix from the front of house. Um, uh, what I'm using that's producing audio is this Nord rack. It's a synthesizer. Um, it's also got a, a, a it's also a drum unit, um, and it doesn't play by itself. I need to send it MIDI. So I have a MIDI cable that's running out of my sound card and into the Nord, and everything else that I'm using is 
effectively just the MIDI instrument. So this is a MIDI controller that is sending MIDI notes back into Ableton uh, Live and from Ableton Live into my synth. Um, this is the Novation Launchpad that's triggering clips, triggering scenes. Um, actually, if you noticed, I didn't use this at all during my arrange view thing, and I, I don't. It's not. It's not a part of my setup anymore. But if you are using the sessions view, it's essential to have something that's really comfy to play on that allows you to push buttons. Uh, the MIDI Fighter Twister is this one. Uh, they have. They have uh, also really robust. I really like it. It's just a square grid. Um, it kind of is makes you think about um, things differently because even when I look at the sessions view, I'm always thinking like a mixer, and it's very easy to see a mixer and understand that okay, each thing has like each thing is a channel, each column is a channel. But here, this is this random square, so it makes you not think in that mode, and it kind of may lead to some some creative uh, mapping and arrangement of stuff. Uh, it has it has the ability to, if you can look, can you see my screen? So I'm just turning that knob there. I've mapped these functions, but you can also press buttons with it, which is helpful. Um, and this is what, something that I recently acquired when I wanted to start playing. Uh, I wanted to start playing my drum li my drums live, uh, but more in the studio. And then when I got it, I realized it was a great performance tool, especially because a lot of my synth lead lines are really um, little blippy loops. And through uh, you know using mallets, it, it, it it's like a a funner way to play them rather than just playing like. I mean, it's actually really fun to play them with sticks. So I've, uh, it's called the Roland SPD-SX. It's a sampler. It also comes with its own sounds. Um, but you can plug it into uh, your computer via USB. And uh, you can also plug in additional, um, additional MIDI devices to it, like different pads and different pedals. Uh, and I, I Everyone would have a problem of not having enough USB ports on your laptop, so I use a powered USB hub. This one is by Hutu. Um, it's also really helpful to have a powered USB hub and not a unpowered. In fact, if you do have an unpowered USB hub, just don't use it. <laughs> I've had many gigs where it's just not been effective. Um, so that's kind of the setup. And at home, I have a bunch of different synthesizers that I would love to tour with, but it's not always practical. So again, it's like, OK, I'm going to play this one synth live, and everything else is audio. It's all been recorded, and I've got it in different, uh, maybe you can look at the screen. I've got it in different tracks. So it might look a bit messy, but I know exactly what's going on. Um, so. Those are my drums, and this is, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I've got one. Do you use the launch pad to trigger different scenes or different parts of your, your song to so kind of progress through the live performance of each track? I do in the sessions view. I don't in the arrange view. Um, that's mostly because I wanted to. I wanted to practice this set as I would for a performance. Actually, it was for this gig that I have coming up, where I was like, okay, I want a really fail-safe method of performance, where I'm sticking to the set list and I've predetermined what it's going to be. Um, and you can. You can actually map these. Uh, you can map. You can map these. Can you see that? Um, and you can have your, uh, your set jump uh, from different parts to different parts. I don't personally feel the need for that here. But otherwise, in the sessions view, I'm absolutely scrolling through the entire set and deciding what, what song I'm going to play next. I might realize that I'm in a scale where the lead lines from another scale can work, and I can mix and match different songs. In fact, a lot of the fun of using uh, the sessions view really comes from mixing and matching. And it, it's, it kind of opens you up to the possibility of creating different songs on the fly, which 
don't necessarily exist as studio versions. And you might take a song that you've produced and then translate it into a live set, but you might find that in your live set you are using bits and pieces from everywhere and it's like a new mm. thing that really works. So I, I usually scroll like this. And then um, maybe you wanna look at my screen. Yeah, and it just helps me like go through the whole set. And if I'm here. And then I want, if I want a, a groove from another song, I can totally just... Okay. And then if I want a bass line from another song, I don't know if this will work, but let's try. Doesn't work, but we can pretend I was mixing. And you know, kind of almost sounds more like a DJ set in a way. So, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so everyone's gonna go home and make an amazing live set. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you for coming. Yeah, oh, cool. How often do you improvise? Um, in this view, it's all improvised. In fact, I, I put this set together with a friend who is a producer called Oxygen in India. We were part of a collective that's called Dasta. Um, and we had just, uh, just kind of joined forces to do a live set. We had about three rehearsals and then we, we had our, our computers uh, synced together using Link. Have, has anyone used Link before? It's so amazing. Uh, like so much, so much better than how it used to be to, to use two separate computers. And uh, the whole entire set was improvised and not just improvised, but also collaboratively improvised. So there was a lot of scope for stuff to go wrong, but a lot of scope for a lot of really amazing things to happen. Um, and in the other view, I have sections where I improvise, but I know that, uh, for example, in the chorus, if I'm supposed to play, that line or whatever, then I'm going to play that line there. And then the arrangement is kind of set in stone in that view, and I improvise within the arrangement. So there are sections in which I can play around, but uh, at X bar, it is going to change. And if I am not ready for it, I'm going to mess up, basically. Yeah. Do you find it's like a, there's more of a reaction when you improvise? or? Yeah, definitely. I find there's more of a reaction when I perform. In fact, the like this works really good in a club. Even the music from this set is kind of meant for, like it's more for the floor. It's kind of trying to in, inspire some more dancing, I guess. And for music where it's not always easy, like trip hop, for example, it's not the easiest thing to perform. Uh, in in those situations, it it makes it makes more sense to use the arrange view. No worries. <laughs> See you. It makes more sense to use the uh, the other view. And um, I don't know. I've always felt that if you're if if someone is able to to understand in a little like understand whatever that means, but in a in a vague sense, get a drift of what you're doing, they're more likely to be able to connect with it. But if they have no idea. Um, like and if it's if you're doing very fine movements, like if you're slowly opening the cutoff, you know, you're just slowly opening the cutoff. It's great to you because it's like, yeah, I'm bringing in that synth line. Like for example, if I were just to, like if you look at my hand, I'm I'm doing this. I'm bringing in the synth, but it's not a very perceptible thing. It's not. It's also because I'm not playing like smashing music or I'm you know throwing a fader down. And in that sense, people don't often understand that you're making a very, very subtle and minute hand action that is translating as a performance. I mean, I would rather, in this context, actually just play that chord, you know? Because at least when I do this, they're gonna be like, ah, I can hear it. So then there's like a more of a reaction or a response. And I guess it's not really trying to attain a reaction, but at least for me, the whole purpose of doing a live set is that I want to be able to connect. Like, I want to use the music to be able to connect with those people. So now I just want to make that process as seamless as possible so that whatever I'm doing is like, please connect with this. <laughs> and not like I'm doing something and, you know, you have to kind of use guesswork to gauge what it is, basically. Yeah. 
Yeah. Any other questions? That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sanaya, Thanks for, for, for joining us. Uh, give it up for Sanaya, Sanju. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I hope that was helpful. <laughs>